King, Lord of Lords, bright morning star. And throughout eternity, I'll sing his praises. And I'll reign with him throughout eternity. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star. And throughout eternity, I'll sing his praises. And I'll reign with him throughout eternity. Amen. Aren't you looking forward to that? All hail King Jesus. We don't have to wait, though, to get to heaven to hail him and to praise him. We can do that down here on earth. And we're glad that you're with us tonight, those that are in the house, those of you that are out there listening online. And tonight we are going to praise King Jesus. We're going to thank him tonight for the blood. And so if you've got your hymnals, turn with me over to page 453 to get started. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Page number 453. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Us. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sean was up here, might as well put him to work, as if preaching's not enough for him. I want two people, real quick to just stand and tell how much the blood means to you. We're not going to wait forever tonight, folks. Two people, very quickly, there will be other opportunities. There's nothing like the blood of Jesus. I mean, we uh, look where we came from and look where he's brought us. And just I was thinking about that today when we ate it. Where did we eat? Joni's. And our secretary, our secretary, our, our waitress, you could tell, was having a really bad time. And uh, we usually tip real well because, you know, on Sundays, churches have a bad rap of 
they just don't tip, and they're some of the worst customers there are. But uh, just the Holy Spirit just rolls in me whenever I go and I see waitresses. I was in the service industry for so long, but we, we tipped her, and she literally broke down. She, she gave us both a hug, and then, then just had all, you could tell she just crumbled. And so I said, can I just pray for you? And so we prayed for her right there in the restaurant. And it's just amazing how he will give us that strength and that boldness to not even think about it, just to do it. You know, and I just know that that, it, may, it blessed me, but also I know that that's how God works in our lives. And that blood that's shed for us just allows us to be open and bold for him. And I just uh, I thank him for that today. It's just exciting to, to know that he's everywhere. Amen. One other, real quick. Who's it going to be? Come on, dream is right up here, Sean. Um, well, if you think about the blood of Christ, you go back to the Old Testament and, you know, to the covenant, not only of the Jews, but of all of the pagan nations around. They all required a, a blood sacrifice of some sort or another, you know. Um, I don't understand that, you know. I thought, God, now why would you do that? What did those little lamb and those sheep ever do? <laughs> but it was the way it was. And today in our Sunday school lesson, we were studying about how we as Christians have to be very careful about what we do around others and that we need not do anything that would cause another one to fall or to slide or to slip. And the lesson was on eating blood animals that had been sacrificed. And Paul was teaching the Corinthians that, you know, you stronger Christians, which I now consider myself to be, but I haven't always been, obviously. Um, you know things know that there's nothing in that lamb or that sheep if it's been offered to an idol. Idol's not anything. There's only one true God. Only Jesus Christ. But if you eat that meat that is known to be sacrificed to idols in front of someone for whom that is a condemnation, you might cause them to participate and then to sin. So we have to be very careful. That's not talking about the blood covering our sin. But one of the things that when the blood cleanses us and when it makes us part of the family of God and it helps us to love God and to love others, we need to be very sensitive to the needs of others. We need to make sure that we live our lives in such a way or that we try our best to live our lives in such a way that we do not lead others who are weaker than we are and who have less understanding and who are more likely to be sensitive to maybe unreasonable expectations than we now are. I used to be that way. And I still am to some extent. You know, there are certain things you hold on to because... There are certain things you feel were God-given convictions, and some are those that mean business. But the sacrificial system continued on, and it was even in place when Jesus was walking on the earth, and the blood flowed. Thousands and thousands of animals were killed, and the blood flowed. But when Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God was crucified and shed his blood on that cross. There was no need for any other blood. It was sufficient. It was sufficient for our salvation. It was sufficient for our cleansing. And it was sufficient for our enablement. And it was sufficient to give us grace and understanding that once we came to understand the role of the Father, the role of the Son, and the role of the Holy Spirit, who is Christ's presence in us. And that's all because 
of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Over on page 449. Four, Sean, you don't, you might as well stay right there. You're going to be doing more of it. 449 is another song about the blood. It says there is power in the blood. Now we're going to jazz it up a little bit on the course, okay? So instead of there is power, power, you know, that old slow stuff, we're going to sing there's power, 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 okay? So let's power it up here. 449, there's power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing from Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. I need two people that have found precious power in the blood to stand real quick and tell it. Real quick. Come on, I'm not going to, I'm not there you go, John. Well, you know that uh, the, our life is like, uh, like a courtroom, and God is the judge, and we're the condemned ones. And Jesus steps in and says, hey, I'm going to take your place. We should have been crucified, but he is the one that took our place, and I'm so thankful for that. In fact, I was talking to Randy today uh, after church. Uh, I've been studying things about the cross. And, and the word excruciating was taken from the cross. It means ex means out of, and cruci means crucified or the cross. And the Romans, because of the excruciating pain that people felt, that was the most horrible and painful death at the time. And they had to come up with a word that meant that uh, extreme of pain. And so it was excruciating pain out of the cross. Man. One more. Who's it going to be? If you don't jump, we're singing. 448. Right across the page. Blood will never lose its power. Aren't you grateful for that tonight? The blood that Jesus once shed for me as my redeemer upon the tree. The blood 
that setteth the prisoner free will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. The blood that cleanses from all sin will never lose its power. It gives us access to God on high from far. Off places it brings us nigh to precious blessings that never die. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. The blood that cleanses from all sin will never lose its power. It is a shelter for rich and poor. It is to heaven the open door. The sinner's merit forevermore. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. The blood that cleanses from all sin will never lose its power. And when with all the blood washed throng we sing in glory redemption song, we'll pass the glorious truth along it has never lost its power it will never lose its power it will never lose its power the blood that cleanses from all sin will never lose its power two more people real quick Real quick, look, you're given the chance. You know, the Bible says in the last days are really that there will come a time when the rocks and stones will cry out if we don't do it. So are we going to praise them or not? Who's it going to be? Two people, real quick. Okay, we're going to move on then. It is good to have you tonight. And we're going to sing a little chorus here in just a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. It's over on page 327. And you probably don't even need the books for it. This little chorus that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We're going to sing that chorus in just a moment. But we are glad this evening that you are here. And it's a special privilege tonight to have a young man with us that we've been praying for. Young man that's been spending a lot of time down under, literally. <laughs> He's been out there at sea and out uh, on, I believe, on the sub, right? If I recall it right. But it's good to have him with us tonight. It's, uh, yeah, my mind just went blank. Um, you know who it is back there. It is good to have him with us tonight. And we are so grateful for him to being with us this evening. We're glad that we can pray for him and for one another. We need to pray for one another. And aren't you glad that we have that opportunity to pray for one another and with one another? It's also the lady that's sitting beside him uh, came back here. I guess she made it in tonight without a cane or anything. I mean, when you get a year older, it gets a little tougher sometimes. But I understand Virgie's got a birthday today, and we say happy birthday to Virgie. 
But we're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. And we all want to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And we need to look full in his wonderful face tonight. And I don't like to put people on the spot or anything, but Cain, could I ask you to do me a favor? Would you come and kneel at our altars tonight? And I, I just want as many of you that will, especially the men of the church, if you'll come and gather around him, and he'll be going back out here in a couple weeks. But if you men would come and kind of gather, I'm going to have Pastor Mike come and pray tonight and say a special prayer for Cain. But I don't want to leave you ladies out either. And so what I'd like you ladies to do is maybe, because i got most of the men up here now, so why, why don't all you ladies just kind of congregate there in the middle somewhere around Kathy? Somewhere there around Kathy. And Dream, I'm going to have you lead out a prayer for the ladies tonight. And I'm going to have Mike say a prayer for Cain and kind of lead this prayer and Mike when you've prayed for him I want you to just pray for everybody if you would Father we do thank you for the blood of Jesus God that precious blood that gives us access to you there on the right hand of the Father because we told we don't deserve it but God your grace and your mercy God we, we pray for you Turn.
more time, but I'm going to ask Tammy just to kind of drop out and join us singing, Tammy. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Would you pray for Pastor Sean as he comes and shares? Good evening. There we go. All right. How many of you guys and ladies remember a man named Steve Irwin? Okay. He was the crocodile hunter, right? Well, there's a new guy who is twice as brave and about five times as dumb as Steve Irwin was, okay? And this guy's name is Coyote Peterson. You ever heard of him? The, the younger ones are like, yeah, I know him, okay? He started off in Ohio, and he was a local TV guy, and he, he did YouTube videos. And what he does is he goes out into the woods, and he does, like, he looks all over for animals and flowers and plants and all kinds of stuff. And he does some pretty dumb stuff. Like he'll go up to this log that I'm sitting there looking at going, don't turn that log over. Don't turn that log over. And he turns the log over. And guess what's underneath of it? A crocodile. Who said crocodile? <laughs> Snakes. There's a nest of copperheads under this log. Now, he's really dramatic, okay, like way more dramatic than he probably should be. So he's like freaking out that there's this nest of snakes underneath this log, okay? And he's like way back away from it, so they're not going to hurt him, but anyway. But he flips it over, and what happens when you flip over a log that has a bunch of snakes over it? What do the snakes do? They go everywhere, right? They scatter. They don't like the light. Well, we have a similar reaction and I've proved this time and time again, when you go in to wake up an eight-year-old, not mentioning any names, when you wake up an eight-year-old by flipping on the light switch and yelling, get up, what do they do? They go, ah, pull their covers back over their head. They don't like the light. They don't like being awake, awoken like that. You're nice and cozy in your bed, and then the light shines on you. And you have to decide whether you're going to wake up or you're going to grab a shoe and throw it at the person that just woke you up. Don't ever throw a shoe at me. <laughs> that feeling of having the light turned on and catching you by surprise, that's what we're going to look at today. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Now this is a very familiar passage with Nicodemus and, of course, John 3.16. But while you're turning there, I'll get you a little bit of context. So at the end of John chapter 2, which, remember, there weren't chapter divisions in the original Bible. Those were put in later. So it's one continuous story. So at the end of chapter 2, we see the cleansing of the temple, where Jesus comes in, he sees people, the money changers, people selling animals for profit, and he clears them out with a whip, and I think that it was made out of the leashes of the animals, but that's my own personal opinion. So he, he gets rid of them, and the officials say, what sign do you give us that you have the authority to do this? What sign? And Jesus goes on to tell them, in three days, or if you just, if this, this, this temple is destroyed, in three days, I will build it back. And so they ask him, you know, you can't do that in three, three days. How are you going to do that? But then he goes on. And in verse 23, 
It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So he knew that they were believing in just the miracles. That's all they cared about was the miracles. They had a very shallow faith. And Jesus knew it. He knew what was in man, what motivates man. Now, it's no coincidence that we start off chapter 3 with, now there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. What he's doing here is saying, this incident that we just discussed, here's an example Here is an example of what I'm talking about. So he's going to illustrate his point, just like a good teacher does. Verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that came from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Again, signs. Nicodemus is focused on signs. It's a shallow faith. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water in the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, And you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, the main story here is about Nicodemus and Jesus. But that's not where I want to go. He's teaching him that there is more to believing than following rules and looking for signs. In verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Again, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So who is we? Who are we? Who who is we? Who is the we in this, this situation, in this phrase? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. Who's the we? Jesus, John the Baptist, Ezekiel, Malachi, all the prophets, even back to Moses. And he goes further and illustrates a point from Moses. He goes back to a story that Nicodemus would have known by heart. Chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so Nicodemus knows right away. He knows the story because he knows the Old Testament. It's not called the Old Testament yet, but he knows what is the Old Testament, that we call the Old Testament. But for us, 
Here's the, here's the story. It's from Numbers chapter 21, starting with verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient along the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? And I love this line. For there is no food and no water. And we lo- loathe this food that you gave us. Their third argument contradicts their first argument. He says, there's no food. But this food that you gave us is horrible. We can't stomach it any longer. They're complaining. Anybody know any complainers? Anybody a complainer? So what happened? They were going around the land of Edom. Now... Edom is a place where the king didn't want anybody, any foreigners traveling through. So they knew they had to go around Edom. The people became impatient. You ever had to take a detour on the highway and go out of your way to get to somewhere? You get impatient. Come on, let's go. You ever get stuck in traffic? So they started speaking against God and against Moses. Think that's a good idea? Yeah. The people were frustrated and annoyed. And they expressed their annoyance to Moses and to God. Verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. You ever going to complain to God again? I don't think it was just because they were complaining. They had been constantly complaining in spite of God giving them everything they needed. A definition of the word sin that I've heard a a pastor use. He says sin is when God gives you a way and you go the other way. And I think that's what they were doing here. They were sinning against God because they were going against the way that he wanted them to go. So he sent fiery or venomous serpents. They bit the people, and many people of Israel died. Verse 7. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. They realized they were sinning. They realized they had done wrong. They confessed it. And then they do what any normal person would do. They tell God exactly what they want God to do to fix it. You ever tell God exactly what you want to do to fix the problem? And the people came, oh, we already read that. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze or copper serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So God answered their prayer request, right? Just not the way that they wanted him to do it. There's still snakes. There's still snakes in the desert. That's kind of odd for there to be snakes in the desert, right? No, it's natural. I think when it says God sent snakes, I think God removed his hedge of protection off of the people and just allowed the snakes to come in. Because it's not natural for snakes to come towards people. 
right? They want to be away from people. They want to be hidden underneath their little logs. But, uh, but God sent them to the Israelites. And now he's not going to take the snakes away. But he did provide a way through. Could you imagine Moses explaining this plan to the people? Now, the class that meets on Wednesday night, we got to see an interpretation of this while watching The Chosen. Moses, he, he looks at this guy, and this guy thinks he's crazy. And Moses, he explains to him that he has learned to trust in God and have faith in him no matter what he says to do. God says, build an ark. Why? Why? It's never rained. It's a crazy plan. All the people have to do is look at a serpent on a pole. Now, Missy would have died because she wouldn't look at it. She's scared of snakes. Okay? But all they had to do was look toward this pole. That's it. That's all they had to do. Easy enough, right? I'm sure there were people that said, that's dumb. I'm not going to do that. It takes faith to be healed. It takes admitting your sin to be healed. In order to be healed, you had to admit that you had been bitten. And then you looked toward the solution. You had to submit to God to be healed. So back to Jesus and Nicodemus, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then we get to the verse that everybody knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God, and then this is the verse that they don't know. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So everybody looks at John 3.16 as a happy, happy, joy, joy kind of thing, right? God so loved the world. But it's more like in this way, God loved the world. Yeah, he loves us so much. That's true. But it's more this is how he showed his love for us. By sending his son. And verse 16 is all happy, happy, joy, joy. But verse 17 brings judgment or separation. And that separation has to come before healing. So when the light, Jesus, exposes our sin, we now know what we're being saved from. When the Israelites had to look at the snake, they knew that the snake venom was running through their, their blood. They knew that they were going to die. But they looked toward that, cr that pole. It's a judgment. They're being judged. You can have faith or not. John 3.19 and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light. Because their works were evil. And this word judgment. In the Greek, it's something like krisis. Okay? We get our word crisis from it. Judgment is a crisis. Just like you flip on the light on an eight-year-old, they cover their eyes. 
and they try to get away from the light. It's a crisis. It's a crisis when Jesus shows us our sin, and we have to deal with it. We can either flee from the light and go back to our sin, or we can follow him and be forgiven. But just like the snakes, when you flip over that log, they scatter because they don't like the light. We as humans don't like the light. We don't want to have our sins exposed. We love them. We love the darkness. And I, the way that John puts this, For God so loved the world, but the world so loved the darkness. The medicine, the, the anti-venom is there. We just have to look towards it. Verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The medicine is the grace and love of God. The syringe is the cross. Just like the anti-venom for the snakes was looking at the crop or at the pole. That's the method of delivery. And it takes faith to be healed. It takes admitting your sin to be healed. It takes submission to God to be healed. When we face that crisis, when we see the holiness and the purity of Jesus standing in front of us, taking our sin, putting it on the cross, we can choose darkness or we can choose light. But we know what we're being saved from. We know what we're being saved from. We have a, a sinful nature. That sinful nature is running through our blood. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 2, chapter 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But there is hope. There's hope even in the midst of snake bites. You ever been in a situation and you feel like you're being bitten by a bunch of snakes? Not literally, but you feel like things are happening to you from all sides. You're not sure what to do. God gives us a way to live, to get through the snake bites. Verse 4 of Ephesians 2. But God, I love those words, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We can't do it by ourselves. If you were bitten by a snake, a venomous snake, a rattlesnake, a copperhead, there is nothing that you can do. There's nothing you can do until you get that anti-venom. You can cut your arm off. You can put a tourniquet on. 
but eventually it's going to spread. Your skin's going to start dying. Your muscles are going to break down. There is nothing you can do. We have to rely on Jesus and what he did on the cross. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we know what we were saved from, sin and death, and now we know what we're saved for, good works in Christ. But it's not until we see our sin that we know what we're fighting against. It's not until we, our sin is exposed, the light is shine, shone on it, shined on it. Kathy, don't judge me. <laughs> All right. Just as after the cleansing of the temple, when Jesus tells the disciples in the crowd that he's going to rebuild the temple in three days, they ask him for a sign. Jumping back to John chapter 2. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. They didn't believe it until they saw it. They didn't believe that he was the way to be saved until he did it. And just like the disciples, we must submit our lives to Christ daily. Yes, there's that day that we say, I'm going to live my life for Christ. But then there's the next day, and the next day, and the next day. We have to get up in the mornings and take that injection. Put it in us. And that injection becomes the prevention because it's on our minds. We are constantly looking toward Jesus. The medicine is the grace and love of God. But it is being delivered through the syringe of faith in Christ Jesus. It takes faith to be healed. It takes admitting your sin to be healed. It takes submission to God to be healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you broken people, wandering around in the wilderness, grumbling and complaining that you're not doing enough for us. But Lord, it's us. We're the ones who are not doing enough for you. Lord, we don't understand. It's not logical for us to believe that you would send your son to the earth to die for us. It's not logical. It takes faith. Lord, as we come up on Easter, Lord, we want to remember that it's not logical for us to believe. We have to work at it. We have to trust in you. We have to have faith. And it's nothing that we can do we have to trust that you already did it. Lord, help us. Help us to, to look toward your cross, not as an idol or a symbol that we worship, but Lord, as the syringe that delivered the anti-venom. Lord, help us.
to be your people. Help us every day to make that decision to, to be in the light. Lord, lead us and guide us as we leave from this place. In your heavenly name, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.